let's begin with a slice of Jewish life uh, describing events that occurred during the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Um, and this is a report that originally appeared in the Yiddish newspaper, The Forwarts, on September 19, 1907. And it was an article that reads as follows. Yom Kippur services in a Clinton Street hall were disrupted due to a fight over a chair. When Joseph Rand showed up in shul with his family, he discovered that one Herman Garber was sitting in one of the seats he had reserved. Rand informed Garber that he was in one of his seats, but Garber produced a ticket indicating that Rand was wrong and that it was, in fact, his seat. Rand responded by punching Garber in the face. Not to be outdone, Garber tore out part of Rand's beard. The lion-like voice of the cantor was drowned out by the screams and howls of the fighting congregants. In the end, both Rand and Garber were forced to finish the Musaf service in Essex Market Court, where both were held under arrest. <laughs> now, this story offers details of minor events involving unknown figures who do not occupy a significant place in Jewish historiography. And there's a fairly good reason why they don't. No one in it appears to have accomplished anything of significance, either in a Jewish or general framework, nor are the events in question exceptional in any way that would seem to warrant serious analysis. However, it is of note that there are thousands of similar stories reported upon in the Yiddish press from the 1870s through the 1950s, a matter which permits us to look at issues like violence or failure, as well as their often unpleasant consequences, as distinct phenomena within Jewish life. Taken as a whole, stories of the Jewish lowlife can thus be considered a matter for serious study. Now, to be honest, Jewish history, like most other history, is largely about elites. Rabbis, scholars, writers, artists, politicians, scientists, and businessmen, business people rightly fill the rosters of Jewish history books. There's also been a more recent focus on social history, but that also has a mostly upwardly mobile trajectory. Studies like Hasia Diner's on Jewish peddlers or Adam Mendelssohn's on Jewish garment workers invariably begin with figures of modest origins and end with phenomenal commercial success. Even ostensibly lowbrow studies of Jewish gangsters like Robert Rockaway's or Jenna Joslett Weissman's uh, are framed as upwardly mobile histories of perseverance that, despite engaging in highly illegal activities, conclude with great financial success. So what's clearly evident is that the historiography is full of Jewish, Jewish success stories. This doubtlessly makes sense since this is the general trajectory of most historiography. But it's also of note that most of these histories have their origin in severe poverty, upheaval, and immigration, all of which occurred on a mass scale for Jews in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But what of a consideration of downwardly mobile Jews? What about the failures, those who either didn't succeed or who faced traumatic life experiences that exacerbated already problematic situations? Where are the blockheads, the failures, or the just plain strange in the Jewish past? The brief report I, uh, about Joseph Rand and Herman Garber fighting in Shul on Yom Kippur I read at the beginning represents a little known but eminently interesting corner of Jewish history, one that reveals aspects of Jewish life that have largely escaped the purview of historians. Now, if most Jewish history books focus on elites, then it's likely that they tend not to consider figures like abortionists, murderers, rioters, prostitutes, bigamists, drunks, extortionists, psychics, and charlatans. But my book does. In it, you'll find a man, for example, by the name of Rosenzweig, who accidentally kills a woman and then decides uh, that rather than to dispose of her body properly in New York, where he lives, that it's a better idea to pack her in a trunk and try to mail it to Chicago. <laughs> he doesn't succeed. Then there's Pesach Rubenstein, who decides to murder his housekeeper slash cousin slash lover because he accidentally got her pregnant and found out that his real wife was on her way over to New York from Poland. Among others, there's a 1927 rabbinical court hearing in Warsaw during which the rabbis had to call the police because litigants in a divorce proceeding were smashing chairs over each other's heads and destroying the courtroom. Apparently just another day in Yiddishland. Now, as noticed, 
as noted, marginal events and figures like these do not appear very often in history, in Jewish history books. Scholars haven't much ta haven't taken much interest in Yiddish-speaking sideshow performers, professional wrestlers, or pickpockets. But Yiddish journalists did take an interest, and so did their readers. And their stories fill up the pages of Yiddish daily newspapers, the first form of mass media uh, among Jews, and one of the only places you can find Jews of all kinds, from brilliant scientists uh, to circus freaks, from rabbis and scholars to tattoo artists and drag queens. The best and worst of everything appear on the same pages of Yiddish newspapers sandwiched together among announcements for things like public debates on the existence of God and advertisements for post-Passover constipation products. <laughs> These among millions of other products and things that you've quite possibly never heard of unless you read Yiddish newspapers. Now, one of the odd things about the Yiddish press is the way it got started. One might think that, it, that there would have been dozens of Yiddish newspapers in 19th century Eastern Europe, which held the largest Jewish population in the world, the vast majority of whom used Yiddish as their vernacular. But this region, known as the Pale of Settlement, was controlled by the Russian government and was the area to which they restricted their empire's Jews. Under Russian rule, Jews were not permitted to own land, they were limited to certain kinds of occupations, and were forced to pay special taxes, among other oppressive issues that made their lives difficult. So it goes, to, it goes without saying that a free press in Yiddish, or really in any other language, was not in any way a possibility in this time and place. But when Alexander II assumed the throne in 1855, things began to change. In addition to freeing the serfs, he changed some of the legislation surrounding Jews, allowing them a bit more freedom. Some of the Jewish intellectuals involved in the Haskalah, or the Jewish Enlightenment movement, which sought to emancipate Jewish life, saw this as an opportunity to begin publishing newspapers, which they had seen and read in languages like Russian and German. In particular, a wealthy Odessa-based women's wear manufacturer by the name of Alexander Tsederboim thought it would be a good idea to publish a newspaper to disseminate news to the Jews of the Pale. So with the government connections that he had, he obtained permission to publish a weekly newspaper in Hebrew called Hamelitz. And this is what the first page of it looked like, or front page of it looked like. Uh, so why publish a newspaper in Hebrew a liturgical language uh, that no one spoke at the time. Hebrew had become the literary language of a small coterie of intellectuals of which Sederboim was a member. His choice of Hebrew also reflects the attitude of Jewish intellectuals toward Yiddish, one that was almost uniformly negative. Jewish elites, many of whom spoke the language themselves, considered Yiddish to be uh, barbaric and deformed, and its speakers, meaning the vast majority of Eastern European Jews, uh, incapable of intelligent thought as long as they spoke it. As long as Jews speak this jargon, or Yiddish, they thought, the masses will never become civilized, nor will they be able to become proper citizens in the countries in which they live. So when Sederboim launched his Hebrew paper in 1860, uh, he was only able to get a few hundred paying subscribers, which, to be honest, is a very weak result for the region with the largest Jewish community in the entire world, which numbered between four and a half and five million. Now, one of his stated motivations was to educate the Jews of the Pale. And when he realized that his Hebrew paper wouldn't be able to do it, he reluctantly came to understand that if he wanted a mass audience, he would have to do it in Yiddish. So in 1862, he launched a newspaper called Kolmavasar, uh, the first Yiddish weekly in the Russian Empire. And this is what the first uh, page of the very first issue looks like. It came out in October 1862. And I could just point out one interesting uh, fact about this is this first front page article is about the American Civil War. And uh, what's interesting about that is it's probably the first time that Yiddish readers in this area are hearing about this. Uh, and so uh, what's fascinating is the way, uh, the kind of naive way in which they describe America at events. Uh, they say, um, they actually are very open about it. They say, we don't know much about this new country, America, but we heard that it's pretty nice. Uh, 
they don't seem to care if you're a Jew or a Christian, uh, and the country is run by businessmen. <laughs> you know, the country apparently is still run by businessmen. You know, you could decide for yourselves how well that's going. Um, and it's, it's, they're also shocked to find out that uh, they have slaves in America. That seemed, you know, that seemed to have been a thing of the past. Uh, so it's really kind of an interesting look at, at, at how, um, you know, before the great immigration of Jews in the 1880s to this country, uh, you know, how, you know, what they were learning about it, what they might have known about it. Now, this newspaper would become one of the most important developments in Jewish cultural life during the 19th century. Notably, it became the cradle for modern Yiddish literature. Uh, serialized novels were published in weekly installments, uh, among them biting social satires that were written by authors of really outstanding quality. Readers clamored for this material, and on the occasion that a weekly installment didn't appear on time, the paper uh, was deluged with letters demanding an answer from its readers as to why. Um, it's also of note that uh, the paper was deluged with letter. Uh, I'm sorry, the paper, um, uh, the literary element is the best known aspect of this paper, uh, which is really a testament to the dominance of literary scholarship in Yiddish studies. And unfortunately, interest in the paper's literary component has obscured other aspects, notably the ways in which it brought all kinds of information about the wider world, about current affairs, history, and science into the small shtetls in which Jews lived, uh, matters which were really no less important to readers than the literature that, that it provided them with. Uh, one example of this, uh, in the third issue of Komavasar, which uh, appeared in uh, early November 1862, an article appeared about the giant sequoia trees in California. Now, this was doubtlessly the first time that, uh, that, re that re Yiddish readers in the Pale of Settlement are hearing about the giant sequoia trees in California, and it's, um, this is you know, the first time they're hearing about either of them. Uh, and uh, they are described to them as, uh, as being wider than the widest house you've ever seen and taller than the tallest tower you've ever seen. You know, it's, it's, it's hard for these people even to conceive of such a thing. Um, they're also described as, uh, as thought, to, uh, thought to have been uh, eight to 10,000 years old. And all of this must have seemed completely unbelievable to the Yiddish readers in small shtetlach throughout the Pale. You know, in gigantic trees taller than anything they've ever seen, wider than house, the widest house they've ever seen. They're eight to 10,000 years old. Uh, and in fact, about a month after this article appeared, uh, the editors publish a letter from a reader that says, Dear editors, I'd like to uh, tell you how much I enjoy your newspaper and that I'm learning a great deal from it. Uh, I especially liked this interesting article about these enormous trees in this place called California, but I think you must have made an error because how could a tree be eight to 10,000 years old when the world itself is only 5,623 years old? <laughs> so in a nutshell, this really explains uh, the, um, the breadth of knowledge of Jews in the shtetl and the ways in which the newspaper must have completely exploded their world views. And so as scholars such as Sarah Stein and Nati Cohen have observed, newspapers to a large degree were responsible for making Jews modern. Yiddish newspapers taught Jews all about, all about the world around them and served as guides to their new lives in big cities or in new countries. The only form of mass media available to them, Yiddish newspapers not only filled, the, uh, filled them with information about world and local affairs and taught them about history and politics, these papers also taught them how to survive in new, in, new environments. Uh, and I'll just show you, this is the uh, front page of the Forverts, which was the um, largest and most successful Yiddish newspaper in history. It began appearing in New York in uh, April uh, 18, uh, 1897, uh, and it is still in publication today. Uh, I'll just point out one quick thing. This is the first uh, page of the first issue. And the, um, the first column article is, talks about how since the Jews have moved into the Lower East Side of New York in large numbers and have supplanted Irish immigrants, 
all of the Irish pubs that used to be on all the corners have disappeared and have been replaced by a particular uh, type of store that all Jews need more than anything else. That was the pharmacy. It went from one form of self-medication to another form of medication. Um, so Yiddish newspapers taught immigrant, immigrant Jews all kinds of things. It taught them how, newspapers taught them how to vote, how to buy insurance, uh, how to walk the streets without getting pickpocketed, how to buy a pair of shoes without getting ripped off, all kinds of seemingly simple matters uh, that confronted them when they arrived in a new city or in a new country. Uh, the Yiddish press even taught them, uh, for example, how to play baseball. This is a, a 1909 article from the, from the Forverts. Uh, that uh, explains in Yiddish with a diagram on how to play baseball. Uh, I'm not sure the editors thought that, you know, Yiddish-speaking immigrants would run out and play, but they understood that uh, it was an important part of American cultural life to understand this game. Also, their children played, and they felt that it was just important to understand what this was and how it functioned. Uh, the, uh, this newspaper also gave Jews uh, advice about their love lives. Um, this is a column called the Abintel Brief, uh, and it's, a, um, it's an advice column to which readers wrote in and the editors gave them advice about all kinds of different matters, uh, usually advice to the lovelorn. Um, so... Writing and writers um, played an enormously important role in the modernization and secularization of Jews. Regarding the role of the writer in modern Jewish society during the early 20th century, Alexander Mugdoini, a Yiddish cultural critic, wrote the following, and I'm quoting, The writer had become a kind of rabbi, a new rabbi, not one that takes payments for queries, not one who gives blessings and advice, uh, but one who teaches. He says something new, something beautiful, something electrifying. So for an increasingly secular Jewry, writers and journalists were part of a new intellectual class that was supplanting rabbis as a communal authority. And as it grew into a true mass media during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Yiddish press would eventually cater to virtually every political and social orientation. Everything from anarchist to traditionally religious and whatever lay between appeared on newsstands. Because the press was the only form of mass media, every organization under the sun published something. And so for a certain number of you in the audience, I think, who have read newspapers for many years, you can understand this idea that your one source of news was the newspaper. You know, in the early, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, that was it. There was no radio. There was no TV. There was no internet. Um, you know, everyone today sits in bed and the whole world comes to your phone, which is a completely different idea than uh, having to walk to the corner to buy a, a sheaf of paper in order to find out what's going on in the world. It's a, it's a really different, uh, you know, different matter. News delivery has changed so dramatically. Um, so... What's interesting here about the breadth of the Yiddish press is for a culture that uh, 19th century Jewish intellectuals considered to be devoid of intelligent thought, the variety of Yiddish publications that came into existence uh, beginning in the early 20th century is absolutely staggering. There's literally something for everyone. And I'll just quickly go through a number of samples. Um, and all, all of these are from New York. The Yiddish press existed anywhere there were Yiddish speaking, there was Yiddish speaking Jews. Um, but the, the New York was really the main cultural center in the United States. So this is uh, the newspaper, the Yiddish Tagablad. It was the first Yiddish, Yiddish daily newspaper, began publishing in 1884. Uh, and it was, um, you know, each of these newspapers has its own kind of political and social orientation. And this newspaper could be considered kind of orthodox, but also sensationalist. Uh, this newspaper is the Varheit. Uh, this was an offshoot of the Forverts, which I showed you before. The Forverts, incidentally, was a socialist newspaper. Um, the Varheit was also socialist, but also uh, Zionist. The Freie Arbeiter Stimme was an anarchist newspaper. Uh, Der Morgenjournal, 
was a morning paper. You had morning newspapers and afternoon papers. Uh, this newspaper was Orthodox, but not only Orthodox Jews bought it, um, because this newspaper had the biggest section of classified ads. So if you were looking for a job, this is the newspaper you would buy. Uh, you also have Der Tog, uh, which is um, sort of an intellectual, more intellectual uh, and higher quality uh, literature uh, type of paper. Uh, and then you have the Freiheit, which uh, was the Yiddish communist newspaper. And these are all daily and a uh, couple of weekly newspapers. You also have a very large number of, uh, of monthlies uh, that really span a wide variety of different interests. So you have things like the Freuden Journal, a, a women's magazine. Uh, you have Der Yiddische Farmer for Jewish farmers. You have all kinds of literary magazines. This one is called Schrift, and this is Literature and Arts. Uh, you had a number of different um, uh, humor and satire magazines. These are uh, Der Kibitzer and Der Greuser Kundis. Then you have Die Zukunft, which is a socialist literary magazine. Uh, and Der Hammer, a communist uh, Yiddish literary magazine. Uh, and I could just point out in, a, in just in a couple of these things that some of the artwork on, uh, in, in these magazines, and this is from 1928, you can see, um, you know, some of the artwork is, is really kind of compelling. Uh, this is uh, Te'alit, which is a, a magazine for theater and literature. Then you have magazines like these, uh, both um, uh, monthly magazines for vegetarians. Uh, you know, I, vegetarianism has become big business in the last uh, decade, let's say, uh, but it's really nothing new. Uh, vegetarianism was popular then as well. Uh, you also have all kinds of, um, of uh, occupational magazines, and this is just one example. Uh, this is called Der Laundryman, which is the laundry man, and it's for Jews who owned laundries, you know, people who owned, you know, who, who did wash people's clothes. Um, you also have the same phenomenon uh, of a greater breadth in, in uh, Yiddish publications in the Russian Empire and eventually in independent Poland, uh, but not until after the turn of the 20th century. So because everything was censored and everything was controlled by the government in the Russian Empire, you don't have the appearance of the first Yiddish daily uh, until 1903, and that's what this is. It's called the Freint. Uh, then you have a second uh, Yiddish daily coming out called Heint, or today, in Warsaw. And Warsaw really becomes the, uh, cult, the, the main Yiddish cultural center, center in Eastern Europe. Uh, and Heint was the leading daily, leading daily. It was a Zionist newspaper uh, in Warsaw. Then you have Moment, which is another daily out of Warsaw. Um, you also have Unser Express, which is yet another daily, uh, which is known to be more sensationalistic. Uh, than the others. You also have, just like in New York, lots of weeklies and monthlies. Uh, this is Literarische Blätter, which is kind of like the New York Review of Books, um, oops, sorry, New York Review of Books uh, in, uh, in Yiddish, uh, really the leading literary weekly. Uh, you also have an interesting phenomenon uh, that this represents. This is called Orthodoxische Jugendblätter, or uh, Orthodox Youth Newspaper. Uh, now, initially, uh, Hasidim and, uh, uh, and ultra-Orthodox Jews, didn't per their, their rabbis didn't permit newspapers and other publications uh, because it was considered a kind of new technology and they weren't really interested in that. But what they discovered was that um, Orthodox Jews were reading secular newspapers, and this is something that their rabbis did not want. So they ultimately decided that they had to publish their own newspapers, and this is one example of it. Um, you know, a, lit a literary uh, uh, newspaper for uh, Orthodox, uh, Orthodox uh, youth. Uh, now, on the other side of that, that coin, you have magazines like this. This is called Der Freidenker, or The Freethinker. This is a magazine in Yiddish for Jewish atheists, uh, many of whom were very militant. Uh, and there's a chapter in my book about this. This organization uh, used to uh, hand out free food to Jews on Yom Kippur. Uh, when you're not supposed to eat. Uh, and they would only give you food if you were Jewish. 
the whole the whole purpose of the exercise was was to was to break the holiday, um, and they they went out of their way to antagonize religious Jews, and there were frequent fights um, and a, subsequent arrests in the streets on Jewish holidays when they would would come out and and sort of harass uh, uh, Jews coming out of synagogues. And this is this is their magazine where they discuss you know their plans for for doing these things. Uh, you also have uh, magazines like this. This is called uh, The Jewish Immigrant. And, uh, in, and this is a really interesting phenomenon because in 1924, the doors to America were virtually shut to Jewish immigrants coming from Eastern Europe. And they needed to find places to go. So this was a magazine that provided information about all kinds of different places uh, that Jews could emigrate to because the the economic situation, the social and political situation in Poland and elsewhere in Eastern Europe was very difficult for Jews, and a lot of them were desirous of emigration. So there are articles on all kinds of places in their Jewish communities like Chile or the Dominican Republic or Australia, um, so that Jewish potential Jewish immigrants could find out and and try to make their way there if they were if they were interested. Uh, you know, out of Warsaw, you also have newspapers like this. This was a weekly newspaper called the Sports Newspaper. So if you wanted to read about boxing or soccer or hockey or tennis in Yiddish, this is, this is what you would read. Uh, you also had magazines like this. This is called Volksgesund or The People's Health. It's a popular health magazine. Uh, and it has all kinds of articles in it about health issues. There are, um, you know, ranging from, you know, issues about exercise and disease to um, why you should wash fruits and vegetables before you eat them um, to articles like this, which in Yiddish is entitled, and I don't know how many Yiddish speakers I have in the audience here, but uh, the title of this is Nitschbein nach der Podloge, which means don't spit on the floor. <laughs> and it's an article that explains why you shouldn't spit on the floor. Uh, now, why would, you know, in this appeared in the 1920s, why, you know, it would, it would seem that you wouldn't really, this wouldn't be necessary. But the reality is that uh, people who were migrating from small towns to big cities needed this kind of information because very often if you lived in a small town or a village, you had a floor of a house that was dirt and straw and you might just spit in it because you could just clean it up by moving the straw. Um, you know, people weren't educated to do these things, and they had they had to become educated in order to understand you know these kinds of uh, these kinds of health issues. In Warsaw, there was also uh, a very uh, um, popular humor press, and these are just two examples. This is their bluffer, the bluffer, and the shagets, um, which is sort of the delinquent. Um, and the, you know, these these have cartoons and parodies of the news and all kinds of really, you know, humorous and satiric uh, matters involved. Now, one last thing I'd like to talk about um, is, or not, it's not the last thing I'm going to talk about, but one thing I want to mention is the popularity and importance of newspapers to its readers. People were really dedicated and beholden to the newspapers that they read. And uh, Richard mentioned that I work at YIVO, and YIVO is a historical research institute that has archives of uh, over 23 million artifacts. And among these uh, is a huge photo archive that has about 400,000 photographs of Jewish life, mostly from Eastern Europe, but from all over the world as well. And looking through some of these photographs, I discovered a number of, uh, a fairly, fairly significant number of photographs of people posing with newspapers. Um, <laughs> Now, one interesting aspect to this is in this time, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, photographs were far more rare than they are today. I mean, today, people take 100 photographs every hour. It's, you know, the, people take a lot of pictures now. But then photographs are relatively rare, and you might only have one or two photographs of yourself in your entire lifetime. It's, you know, it's, it's so to choose to take a photograph of yourself or to choose to pose with the newspaper you read uh, is really significant. People, people really cared about their newspapers. So here's just as an example of a, of a school uh, in, in Pinsk in 1936 in Poland um, of, of girls reading their newspapers in their library. Here's another one uh, from Romania. 
um, of uh, students reading uh, newspapers in, in a library or posing with these newspapers. And then you have all kinds of individuals uh, who, who posed with the newspapers. Here's, here's an Orthodox young man uh, from Poland who's posing with the newspaper he read. And then here's a secular young man posing with the Volkszeitung, the, um, the Bundist, so Polish, Polish Jewish socialist newspaper. Uh, and then you also have uh, this one from New York uh, with, you know, readers of the Forverts, workers, you know, posing with, with the newspapers. They were proud of this paper. You know, they felt it really, really represented them. Now, the late 19th and early 20th century heyday of the Yiddish press functions as kind of a disjointed chronicle uh, of Jewish urban life that tells us stories about the Jewish past that cannot be found anywhere else. The Yiddish press contains an enormous amount of data on Jewish life of the period, ranging from politics to literature to theater to religion and daily life, which are really the things that most people remember as having been recorded by daily newspapers of the era. But there's really so much more. So uh, during the course of my graduate research, which dealt with, as which dealt with aspects of the Yiddish press, I was requ required to read it extensively. And in doing so, I began to find large numbers of strange stories about Jewish criminals, imbeciles, and failures. And these journalistic reports presented aspects of migrant and immigrant Jews that, after having spent years in Jewish history classes and, and after having read thousands of pages of texts, I'd never conceived of. Uh, I also realized that academic explorations of the seamier sides of Jewish life were extremely limited, and I concluded that at some level it was important uh, to uh, that common people and their problems become part of the historical record. So the forgotten stories that I chronicle in my book provide a look at the seamy underbelly of Jewish urban life, a peek into the frequently troubled world of migrants in big cities where any potential step or any misstep is potential news. Now I want to briefly talk about the, the ways in which I fell into this project. Methodologically, this book was really an accident. I didn't go looking for the stories, but as I mentioned, I stumbled in, uh, into them during the course of research on other things. And so here's one example. When I was in graduate school, a friend who worked in the rare book room of the Jewish Theological Seminary asked me if I would take a look at a strange Yiddish newspaper he had found. It was uncatalogued and undated, and it was not typeset, but handwritten and lithographed. And this is what it looked like. Uh, it also had a number of gruesome images on it, including one of a murder scene and another of the police showing a frightened man a dead body in a morgue. So I had never seen a Yiddish newspaper that looked like this, so I was in intrigued. I read the text, which turned out to be about a man by the name of Pesach Rubinstein, who I mentioned at the outset, uh, who had allegedly murdered his cousin slash lover slash housekeeper after getting her pregnant and discovering that his wife was on her way over from Poland to the United States. Um, now, I had never heard of this unusual case. Uh, and I began to look through the indexes of American Jewish history books to see if there was any information on it. You know, I would I went to the American Jewish history section of the library, sort of pulling books off shelves, looking in the indexes for Pesach Rubinstein or other names that were relevant to the case. And um, I found three books that mentioned the story. One of them had one, one sentence about it, another had a paragraph, and another had a page and a half. The rest of them had nothing. And I looked at about 50 or 60 books. So I was somewhat surprised. I guess, you know, I thought to myself, well, it's not really, it must not have been that important of a story. So at the time this happened, and this was probably about 2004, 2005, a new database had been published of American newspapers from the 17th century to the 1920s. And it was word searchable. So, and it had hundreds and hundreds of newspapers in it. So I went to this database and I put in the name Pesach Rubinstein and I got 999 hits. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. Uh, I um, began looking through them, and what I discovered was virtually every newspaper in the United States wrote about this case. It wound up, it, you know, Pesach Rubinstein was eventually arrested. He was put on trial. He was, sentenced to, he was sentenced to hang and wound up committing suicide in prison. 
Uh, it was a huge story. It was essentially the OJ trial of 1876. <laughs> and yet American Jewish historians had virtually ignored it, which I found so incredibly surprising. And in addition to finding you know, all of these references, these really thousands of references from newspapers all over the country, uh, I began to do more and more research, and I discovered that uh, there were uh, four popular pamphlets, uh, sensationalistic, lurid pamphlets, actually from which these images were taken. There's a really interesting 19th century uh, publishing phenomenon called murder pamphlets, where uh, eight to 16 page pamphlets were published about popular uh, murder trials that were always accompanied by uh, sensationalistic imagery. And uh, it was, you know, it was, a, it was sort of a form of pulp literature that, that really preceded the pulps. Uh, and typically for big murder trials, you would have one, maybe two murder pamphlets published. As I mentioned, for the Pesach Rubinstein, Rubinstein trial, there were four published. In addition, the entire trial transcript, transcript was published as a book after the trial for just popular reading. I also found in an anthology of popular music from the 1870s uh, a song listed called My Name is Pesach Rubinstein. <laughs> so it turns out that this was absolutely an enormous uh, event and really the, the most significant interface between Jews and American media uh, up until that time in the country. And yet it had been really virtually ignored. Um, which I really found strange. And so I thought, you know, this really needs to be written about. And so it, it, there's a chapter on it in, my, in, in the book. Um, now, another way I fell into this project was because of cartoons. So Richard mentioned that uh, my dissertation was on cartoons of the Yiddish press. Uh, and uh, sometimes when I was researching these cartoons, when I was looking through Yiddish newspapers for old cartoons, I would find cartoons that I didn't, understand. It would have characters or figures in them or references that I, I, I just didn't know who they were. And so when I was looking through the Yiddish newspapers of Warsaw in 1929, uh, in March and April in particular, I began to come across uh, many cartoons uh, with, that featured this woman. Uh, she, al she always had straight black hair, ample cleavage, and a unibrow. And I, you know, saw, I kept seeing this woman over and over, and I couldn't figure out, you know, who this person was. You know, why was she, who was she? Why was she appearing so often? Um, here's another one. The caption of this is, ay, 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 look at those matzo balls. Um, <laughs> so you could sort of get an idea of what the Yiddish humor press was like. So she was always, uh, um, she was always marked as Miss Judea or Miss Judea. So I kept thinking, well, you know, who is Miss Judea? What, you know, what is this? It's, it's, it's such a kind of a strange thing. And so as I began to research it, as I began to read the daily newspapers to figure out who this woman was, what I discovered was that she was the winner of a Jewish beauty pageant called the Miss Judea pageant that took place in uh, spring of 1929. And this is what she looked like in real life. Um, and her name was Sophia Oldock. Uh, so... When I began to research the story uh, behind the cartoons, I discovered that it wasn't really, that all of the cartoons weren't really just about a beauty pageant, but about a political scandal that engulfed all of Jewish Warsaw. Uh, briefly, a, um, it all started when a Polish language Jewish newspaper uh, uh, called Nash Pszeglund organized this beauty pageant. And they did so because they figured that um, a Jewish girl would never win the Miss Poland pageant. So they thought, we need to create our own. So they created a, a Jewish beauty pageant. And what they did was they put out an open call for all Jewish girls across Poland to participate, and they asked them, that, asked them to send their photographs into the newspaper, which many did. And they, pu they published for about six weeks in their illustrated supplements hundreds of photographs of these girls, along with a number, um, and at the end of about six weeks, they uh, printed a form with 10 uh, slots on it for readers to choose the top 10 uh, uh, contestants that they liked the most. And these top 10 contestants would then 
uh, participate in a runoff gala event to choose the winner at the posh Hotel Polonia. So uh, Sophia Oldak was chosen as the winner at that event. And in the wake of that, she was brought all over Warsaw to uh, take photographs with all the local Jewish celebrities, the great Yiddish writers, uh, uh, actors and directors from the Yiddish theater, politicians, um, all, you know, all kinds of people. The president of the Warsaw Jewish Community Council, uh, which was a quasi-governmental agency to which Jews paid taxes and elected representatives, invited her to uh, the Community Council building for a banquet in her honor, uh, at which he praised her beauty and sang her uh, portions of Song of Songs. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with Song of Songs, but it's there are portions of it that are essentially an erotic poem that was kind of smuggled into the Bible uh, and something that tr religious people would consider inappropriate to apply to a, an actual person instead of God. So when the ultra-Orthodox political parties in Warsaw and who were also members of the Jewish Community Council found out about this, they were furious. And they immediately brought all the students out of their yeshivas to hold protests in front of the community council building. Now, the uh, secular Jewish newspaper that had organized the pageant found out about this, and they brought people to protest the uh, ultra-Orthodox protesters. Uh, so on one side of the street in front of the community council building, you had secular Jews protesting. On the other side of the street, you had Orthodox Jews protesting. And in the middle, you had Polish policemen who really didn't know what was going on <laughs> with the Jews. Now. About a week after this, the protests die down, and the the episode be, sort of begins to fade into the the mem you know the memory of of Warsaw Jewry. But the vice president of the Warsaw Jewish Community Council dies, and he is uh, a, a member of the ultra orthodox party Agudas Yisrael, and um, he didn't die because of these events. He was an elderly man, and he he happened to pass away. Now, he was a Hasidic Jew, and uh, his funeral was going to be uh, essentially a state funeral for the Jews at which you would have about 15 to 20,000 Hasidic mourners. Now, the president of the community council had to give a eulogy in the name of the community, and he knew that there would probably be trouble, so he went to the deceased's family and asked if it would be acceptable for him to give a eulogy. And they said, absolutely, of course, you know, you were colleagues at work. Uh, this is the funeral is not a political event. Uh, you know, yes, you should absolutely give a, a eulogy at the funeral. Now, when he arrived at the funeral and mounted the dais, all of the yeshiva students who had been told to protest him the week before began pounding and stamping their feet, screaming, Miss Judea, Miss Judea, Miss Judea the president of the community council realized that he wouldn't be able to give his eulogy that the crowd you know wanted to take him out and he immediately left the the cemetery to boisterous applause now the kids the students the yeshiva students who were chanting wouldn't stop chanting and when the rabbis and the dais and other people in the in among the mourners tried to keep them quiet they began to fight back pushing and shoving started Cain started flying, Strymel started flying through the air, and fists, you know, fist fights started to break out. And it was so severe that the, uh, the dais was smashed so people could grab pieces of wood to beat other people with. And as people were fighting and screaming around the cemetery, an esteemed rabbi and communal leader was lowered to his grave. And that was the real scandal behind this story. Um, but um, what's, uh, what's really amazing about it is um, that uh, just by looking at these old cartoons, I had dr accidentally dredge up, dredged up this fascinating story that, that dealt with a wide variety of cultural, social, journalistic, religious, and political aspects of Jewish life in Warsaw between the two world wars. Now, this is clearly a strange and anomalous event, uh, but it's one that reflected uh, a very diverse and vibrant community engaged in a wide variety of activities. So just by looking at these cartoons, I discovered 
Many such revealing stories, tales of communal affairs that hadn't been considered by historians, but which to my mind complemented tr traditional historiography by adding a, di uh, a different and distinctly human element to it. Now, another time during my work researching cartoons in Warsaw's Yiddish dailies, I discovered that cartoons only appeared in the Friday newspapers. So uh, because I was only looking for cartoons, instead of scrolling uh, the microfilm through the entire week, I would turn the dial uh, uh, so I could go from Friday to Friday and skip what, I, what was ever in the middle. So I don't know how many of you have actually used microfilm, but it's a somewhat tedious way to do research. Uh, so this was, you know, a benefit to me to be able to skip, a, a, you know, a segment and just go for what I needed. So uh, one day I was looking at the newspaper Moment from Warsaw from 1929, and I was skipping from Friday to Friday to steady clip uh, when I accidentally landed on a Thursday newspaper. Um, and the headline in front of me was Two Wives Blazing Punches and the Police. So I thought, okay, that sounds kind of like an interesting story. I'll, you know, I'll read it. So I read the story, and it turns out to be about a Hasidic uh, man in Warsaw who fell in love with his wife's best friend. He married the woman and set her up in an apartment outside of town. Uh, and he shuttled between the two wives, uh, telling the first wife he was away on business when he was visiting the second wife. The first wife's neighbors figured out what was going on, and they told his older brother, who was known to be a fanatically religious person, and his older brother organized a hearing at the Warsaw Rabbinical Court. Uh, he physically dragged his younger brother to this hearing, uh, at which there was a panel of three rabbis waiting. Uh, both wives were there. Uh, and also waiting uh, was th about 30 members of the first wife's family. The rabbis ruled that he had to divorce both women, which they did on the spot. They wrote out writs of divorce. Uh, they gave them to him. He signed them. He gave them to the women who gave them back to the rabbis. It was made official. As soon it was, as it was made official, his brother ran over to him and punched him in the face. The 30 members of the first wife's family jumped on the second wife and began beating her mercilessly. The rabbis ran out, and uh, the shamus or the assistant called the police, who came and arrested everyone. So I sat there in front of the microfilm reader, agog. I was amazed. I had never read anything like this. Um, you know, nobody... You know, I like I said before, I, I have, you know, I'm, I was a graduate student. I had read thousands of pages of texts, sat in hundreds of hours of classes. I'd never read anything like this. Uh, my grandparents who were from Poland never told me stories about people like this. Uh, you know, I was amazed. And my first thought was, you know, I wonder if there are other stories like this. And from that point on, instead of, you know, jumping from Friday to Friday when I was scrolling through the microfilm, I began uh, scrolling very slowly, scanning the papers for headlines, looking for interesting, uh, looking for interesting and relevant articles that that sort of fit this framework. Uh, and so, um, it uh, uh, I ended up finding thousands of such stories. And um, not only did um, did I find some of these stories, but doing research on this type of phenomenon, uh, I discovered that in 1927 that the, uh, the uh, communal rabbinate tried to ban journalists from, from going to the based in, from going to the rabbinical court to report on these matters. And what's interesting is editors of newspapers specifically sent journalists to the rabbinical court because they knew that some juicy story was unfolding before the rabbis and they wanted it in their newspapers. Also, writers like Isaac Besheva Singer and his older brother, Yud Yud Singer, um, were both sent to the rabbinical court and both reported on, on materials like this. And you could see the influence of, of uh, these stories in Isaac Besheva Singer's uh, 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 stories and novels. And, you know, I mentioned that I was working on cartoons. I also found a fair number of cartoons that, that referenced these kinds of events. Uh, and I'll just show you a few here, and you probably 
I don't know if you, all of you can read these, but this is a cartoon entitled New Furniture in the Rabinet. And this, the assistant says, it's a shame to bring that stuff in. It will all be smashed. After one case, it's kaput. <laughs> this one is called Ready for Destruction. Uh, and it shows two men standing outside a window where chaos is taking place. And he said, "New, what's going on? Another, uh, another um, community council meeting. No, it's a divorce case in the rabbinet. Here's one that's called At the Rabbinet, and a man op approaching the door. He says, I've heard I heard they're having a wrestling match here. I came to buy a ticket. <laughs> uh, this one shows uh, rabbis wearing gas masks, and it says gas, the caption is gas masks, mask is a security measure at the rabbinet. Uh, and it says, now we can begin the case, call in the appellants. And this cartoon actually references a real article that had to do with a woman who, uh, who was involved in a divorce case who brought in a bottle of acid and started spraying it all over her, um, her ex-husband and in-laws. Uh, and then you have uh, this one, um, protected from getting punched in a brawl, and it says, new, we can start calling the couple who wants a divorce. We're fully protected. And I'll just read you uh, an example of what, uh, what some of this reportage was like. This, uh, this article appeared in Moment, which is one of Warsaw's Yiddish dailies. Uh, it appeared on uh, February 12th, 1934. Uh, it's called A Hot and Bloody Day in the Rabbinate. Yesterday in the Rabbinate was a hot one and bloody too. Good sense was butchered and the blood flowed like water. And rest assured that the rabbis ran out in the middle of these cases. All of the disputes broke out in connection with divorce proceedings, which unfortunately have occurred all too often as of late. The first fight occurred between the owner of the Garden Restaurant, 45-year-old Masha Becker, and her second husband, 25-year-old Yitzhak Lerner, an employee in her restaurant. Five years ago, Becker's first husband died, and she took Lerner the waiter as her husband. But in the restaurant, she still treated him like a servant. Lerner refused to put up with that, and he called his wife to the rabbinate and asked the rabbis to force her to sign the business over to him. Words were exchanged, and Lerner slapped his wife. This didn't seem to bother her at all, and she blackened his face with the contents of an inkwell. No agreement was reached. A second couple beat each other up over a heated issue. A certain Libel Nyman was a frequent guest over at his fiancée's house, where he would come to eat and occasionally sleep over until his fiancée ended up with a bun in the oven. But in front of the rabbi, he claimed not to know anything about it. What, the girl screamed? Now you don't know anything? Here, now you'll know something. And she punched him so hard in the mouth that she knocked out two of his teeth and completely soaked him in blood. A third case didn't even make it into the courtroom. It played out in the hallway. A young man with four women, two wives and two brides, showed up in the hall. They pounded one another so badly uh, that, uh, that the police had to be called, who were able to pull the combatants apart only after great effort. What a hot day it was yesterday in the rabbinet. <laughs> now, to be clear, it wasn't the divorce cases themselves that brought these goings on to the, uh, in the rabbinical court to the attention of Warsaw's Yiddish journalists, but the violence or the possibility of violence, the element that made the story so appealing. And as I said, editors specifically sent, uh, sent reporters to go and report on these things. Um, now, one of the startling, interesting, startling issues about these stories is that they reveal a component of Yiddish-speaking Jewry that really flies in the face of traditional stereotypes. The plethora of bad and frequently stupid decisions followed by furious anger that explodes in violence occurred so often among these Jews that I'm still surprised that no one ever considered writing about it. While internal Jewish discourse maintains the stereotypes that Jews are highly intelligent, the classic Yiddish kop or Jewish brain, the stories of the Warsaw Yiddish press uh, reported by the journalists, by these journalists, provide a radically different picture. In his book of essays on Freud, Jews, and modernism, the historian Peter Gay comments that, and I'm quoting, there is a historical and sociological study that desperately needs to be undertaken, that of stupid Jews. The material would be abundant, and the results would correct the widespread and untenable notion that Jews are by endowment more intelligent than other people. It's the end of the quote. Gay is undoubtedly correct 
uh, in his assertion that the material would be abundant. The Yiddish press in its heyday from the turn of the 20th century through the 1930s offers myriad stories of imbecilic Jews caught in an endless array of problematic situations. Not only do they function as an antidote to the unreality of an alleged Jewish brilliance, but they are also a joy to read. And I'll just read a few. Um, I don't know, how, about, how are we on time? Five minutes? Okay, I'll read a couple. Um, okay, March 15th, 1913, from the Forverts in New York. 18-year-old Esther Goldberg, a pretty girl who lives at 20 Pitt Street on the Lower East Side, went out early in the morning to the grocery store to get some rolls for breakfast. Suddenly, she saw her neighbor, a young tailor by the name of Harris Bloom, who was coming home late from a dance, getting attacked by a thief who popped Bloom so hard on the head he couldn't see straight. The thief grabbed Bloom's money and took off running. Miss Goldberg, a Cossack of a girl, however, gave chase. She caught up with the thief on Grand Street and punched him so hard he went tumbling down. With that, she jumped on top of him and pounded him with her fist until, she, until he saw stars. The robber was only saved because the police showed up and took him to jail. Um, okay, I'll read one more. This is uh, from Moment from Warsaw, January 3rd, 1938. The headline is Blind Yankel Opens a University for Thieves. The successful but elderly pickpocket Yankov Pomerantz, also known as Blind Yankel, is very popular in the world of thieves. Mainly, he is regarded as an excellent professional, but has also retired and living off the advice he gives to the youngsters while they attempt to go to work. The advice business has done quite well, but since in today's business world one cannot simply charge money for simple words, Blind Yankel came up with another idea. He thus opened a school for young thieves where he teaches his students both the theory and practice of the profession. Professor Yankel even prepared a lesson with mannequins, which the beginners worked on with straight razors. Afterwards, he would bring his young students out onto the streets. The practical street lessons would take place in the markets where there's always a lot of noise and action. Instead of taking tuition, Blind Yankel was paid with his students' first earnings, which they made in the markets. The school business would have gone quite well if not for the police. It didn't take long for them to discover his institution of higher learning. Professor Yankel and his two assistants, Shloimi Mandelboim and Joel Pasternak, landed in Paviak prison. Also held were a number of young talents, also students of Blind Yankel. Now, as I've mentioned, we don't see much discussion of Jews like these in historiography. Yet, in the pages of Yiddish newspapers, these Jews were legion. Short tempers and Jew-on-Jew -Jew violence were common fare in immigrant and migrant Jewish populations. Living haunched by jowl in poor neighborhoods, Yiddish-speaking immigrants not only had to contend with broken families and poverty, but squalid, overcrowded living quarters, job insecurity, and having to live life in a new language, often in an unfamiliar land. The frequent violence that occurs in their communities represents the moments when words failed them and they had no alternative but to raise their fists to communicate. What's more, we, found st we find stories like these in every Yiddish newspapers, in New York, in Warsaw, or in Pinsk. We're lucky that Yiddish journalists had the foresight to record it. Now, when scholars engage in research on Yiddish-speaking Jews, or when families get together and talk about their immigrant forebears, about their bubbies and their zaydes, these are not usually the stories they tell. But these stories are nonetheless part of the Jewish story uh, and unsavory as some of them may be, they warrant a place in the historical record. Bad Rabbi's a small attempt to retrieve some of the flotsam and jetsam of Yiddish land, the stories of the two Jewish two-bit nobodies who have been otherwise who have been otherwise forgotten. Thank you.